Welcome back to Engineering MUS 302. Today we're going to talk about microphone designs. So what we're going to do is look at one of the coolest things in the recording studio, microphones, and the different types of design and how they differ in operation. So we're going to take a look under the hood, so to speak, on how microphones do their thing. But first, a few, a couple de um, definitions. Um, primary one is that microphones are transducers. But what is a transducer? Well, a transducer is anything that converts, any device, should you say, uh, that converts energy from one form to another. So there's many examples of this uh, in our life, light. Uh, bulbs you know convert electrical energy into photonic energy or light even our bodies convert the um, chemical energy from the food into um, energy that we can use in our body so um, but we're going to obviously focus on the types of transistors you would find in recording studios and so let's look at some of those so here are some microphone loudspeaker, tape head, phono cartridge, and let's look at what goes in and what comes out in terms of energy in each of these examples. So energy in on the microphone, what would you guess? Sound or acoustic energy. Okay, and then on the loudspeaker it's kind of the reverse, isn't it? So what comes out, what goes in I should say, is not acoustic but electric. Uh, so that you have a power amplifier going to the loudspeaker and then the loudspeaker moves and makes acoustic energy. So just the reverse of microphones. And we're going to talk about how their design types are, are very similar in some cases. And also let's look at the tape head. So you don't see tape heads too often in the studios this more, anymore unless you have reel-to-reel -reel and cassette equipment. But um, you still should know how they transduce. And so what goes into this? Well, it's inside a tape machine, so it's already been converted to electric energy. Uh, and um, that is incorrect. Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. If you think of it in terms of a playhead, I was thinking about it as a record head. Um, if you think of it in terms of a playhead, it's the magnetic energy coming from the tape. So basically the magnetic change um, that's uh, coming from the particles that are embedded in the tape, which are like little magnets. And as those pass by the tape, uh, playback head, that magnetic energy is converted into electri electrical energy um, and that's fed into um, the tape machine is amplified. So tape head, phono cartridge, mechanical. So what happens here is we have the um, stylus in a groove and as the um, LP or 45 whatever 78 turns around, turns, um, it's going to vibrate that uh, that stylus and that vibration is going to be converted from a mechanical movement of vibration into electrical energy. Well, I gave the uh, output away, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, what happens with a microphone? We take acoustic energy, convert it to electric energy, and we can feed it to a recording console. And then, you know, to a recording device of some sort. Um, loudspeaker, just the reverse. We're going to, we had. Uh, electrical energy in, and we're going to have acoustic energy out. Magnetic, we already talked about this, is uh, we're going to have uh, electric energy out, and the same is true with the phone cartridge. So just some examples of transducers um, in addition to the microphone. You, can, you might want to think about some others and, and present those in class when we talk on uh, Tuesday. Or ask some questions regarding about what transducers might be that you might have in your home or studio. So talking about microphones in specific today, uh, we're going to look at how their, spe their specs or specifications uh, are um, arrived at or given. So what we're looking at here is a chart, and a chart that really just shows you how the microphone responds to different frequencies or different levels of frequency. So what we uh, dial uh, <laughs> um, 
in a perfect microphone, we'd have a, a flat line from 20 to 20,000 cycles. Um, but in um, our microphones uh, in the real world, that rarely happens. I mean, you know, we, well, we're going to have some deviation because transducers are not perfect. And so um, because of that, uh, what we see on the curve here is not a flat line. Um, this is a dynamic microphone made by Shure. Uh, it's a workhorse in the industry. It's a Shure SM57 uh, dynamic moving coil. We're going to talk about what that means in a few minutes. Um, but you can see it's not a flat response. In fact, uh, in uh, below, let's say, 200 cycles or so, it kind of ramps down rather quickly uh, to 10 dB at um, 50 cycles. So that means uh, rather than, you know, what, what, what the frequency response really shows you is, you know, the relationship be between acoustic energy in and electric, le electric energy out. So that's why if it was a flat line, that means it would be for the same uh, amount of acoustic energy in, you'd have an equivalent uh, electrical energy out for all frequencies. That means that we would respond equally to all frequencies, which would be ideal uh, in, in most situations, in a technical sense, at least. We're going to find out, though, that, you know, actually the, the um, characteristics of the frequency responses, one of the reasons we might choose a particular microphone over another and so we actually use the, the variations in frequency response to our advantage as part of our, you know, way we, uh, we aesthetically color the sound in the studio sometimes. So anyway, getting back to this, you can see there's 100 uh, cycles along the bottom. The next little lineup that's not marked would be 200 cycles. At that point, you can see kind of a, a line that goes down to the left. That is showing us that we're having low frequency loss. So we're not getting the same output uh, that we're feeding in. Uh, conversely, going up on the right side, you can see there's a, there's a peak and it kind of comes down um, around the, to the mid midpoint line, a line around 10,000 cycles. So that's a resonance uh, in the capsule and at around 5 kilohertz or 5K, we like to say, we, we use the, the K as to indicate 1,000 cycles, so times 1,000 for 5K is 5,000. Um, we have a peak. And so this is the reason this microphone is actually liked, um, because it has a certain kind of sound based on this kind of curve and other other things too. And we'll talk about like transient response. But this is uh, used a lot on snare drums and guitar cabs and even voice. But um, snare drum is kind of ubiquitous. You'll find this on a lot of different uh, uh, people's miking techniques uh, on on drum set. So anyway, so that's one of the specs. That's called the frequency response. So it's the range of um, sound frequencies the microphone can res uh, transduce effectively. Okay, So that's what it indicates. And frequency response curves can be used for other things other than microphones. It can be used for electronics, for loudspeakers, and all kinds of things. Um, the other spec that we should be aware of is the sensitivity of the mic. And that refers to how much signal level is produced for a given SPL, which means that um, how, you know, if you have a certain amount of energy coming in, how much energy comes out. And, um, and generally, uh, the different design types are going to have different sensitivities. Um, we'll find out the ribbon is the least sensitive, the moving coil next, and the condenser the most. So uh, sensitivity um, will be related to another um, uh, spec called uh, signal to noise. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Also, uh, there's a directional characteristic in the microphone. Uh, so what that means is that, is it sensitive in one direction or all directions or two directions? Um, in other words, the microphone can be pointed a certain direction if it's uh, unidirectional or one directional. Uh, for instance, uh, toward a source we want to pick up and away from maybe another source we don't want to pick up. And we'll talk more about this in a few minutes. So that's another specification you'll find for microphones. And then as I said uh, before, uh, signal to noise really refers to, uh, and it relates to sensitivity in the sense that um, the sensitivity will in, in some way dictate the signal to noise ratio. So what a ratio is, of course, is like a fraction. So we have um, 
the signal being on top of the numerator and the noise level being below. And really what you want to have, of course, is more signal than noise. And so you want that uh, numerator to be much larger than the de uh, denominator of the ratio. Therefore, meaning that uh, the higher the signal to noise ratio value, the better generally in terms of noise specifications. And noise is not everything, but it certainly is something. And if you're trying to record something very subtle, let's say you're doing a Coke commercial and you want to record the sound of pouring Coke into a glass, well, a particular microphone design type might uh, be more well-suited for that than another because of the signal-to-noise um, specifications. In other words, you might have to turn up the gain a lot on some microphones to the point where you would hear a background hiss from the um, amplifier. We'll talk more about that later too. All right, moving on. I mentioned microphone preamplifiers just a second ago. So yes, microphones themselves do not have enough, enough output to directly um, go into uh, recorders. Uh, recorders uh, require a level called line level, which is a certain um, range of voltage uh, voltages, which is really just how we measured uh, decibels um, or um, a level and a, a different decibel uh, rating, voltage rating. And anyway, uh, so the microphone um, levels are so low that we need to amplify them before we can feed them into a mixing console uh, or uh, more uh, importantly into a recorder or an A to D converter to, if we're doing digital or whatever. So um, how does that work? Well, um, we have a microphone, we have some sort of box, or this can actually be in a recording co um, console as well. A lot of most consoles have record uh, microphone preamps built into them, but uh, a lot of studios will use external preamps because they're um, higher quality. So in our studio, we have um, two um, really nice um, Millennium Media A channel um, microphone preamplifiers that we feed into our analog to digital converters. Um, so what we have is a microphone with the, its own uh, low level signal called mic level coming in and then the microphone boosts that level and we have line level out. So the difference between mic and line level will be 30, 40 dB or so <coughs> typically. Um, you know, on this example we're actually looking at a ribbon microphone that's going to require more gain than a moving coil or a um, or a condenser, which are terms we haven't really defined yet, but um, we will in a second. So the, the take home message here is that uh, microphones need preamps uh, so that they can um, um, be boosted to the level that's necessary to feed into the other gear. Um, the preamp itself too, one thing we're going to talk about is sometimes power the microphones if they're condenser microphones and some ribbons uh, even have built-in amplifiers, which we'll talk about in a minute too. So let's look at uh, the design types. We've been kind of uh, looking at some of the designs, but let's define what they are. So we have two major categories, dynamic and condenser, uh, which is another name for capacitor. So um, so uh, number one, dynamic has two sub-levels, which are moving coil and ribbon. So both moving coil and ribbon are dynamic microphones. Um, they just use a different uh, way of, um, of operation, different um, transducing element. Um, the condenser is completely different uh, in its um, way it transduces and requires power, which we're going to talk about in a minute, whereas the dynamic microphones don't. So those are the microphone types. So let's look at uh, how they're actually built. So looking at a cross-section of a moving coil microphone, we have these elements. Uh, the part in which uh, gets impinged by the sound and eventually moves because of the, the, the sound uh, pressure variations. In other words, it vibrates uh, in response to sound pressure changes from the, from the air, um, is the diaphragm. And so that's the, the capsule of the microphone that uh, couples with the air. And then um, it's coupled or connected to a coil of wire, and that coil of wire is wrapped around a magnet. So that magnet has a north and south pole to it, and as you move, <coughs> you know, you have the, uh, the little uh, gray areas above and below the magnet there, and the hashed areas. Um, those are north and south poles of the magnet, and 
as it moves back and forth, what it's doing is actually making the electrons in the coil move one direction when it moves in, and the electrons move another direction when they move when it moves out. And if you do that, of course, with a vibration, what you're going to get is a peak uh, that's going to correspond to the acoustic pressure increase, uh, an electrical wave that has a peak uh, voltage. And then when it moves the other direction, it's going to have a dip to, uh, corresponding to the uh, low pressure zone of the wave. So what it's going to do is it's going to make it a complete analog of the acoustic wave in electrical form, which is what a transducer does. So we have uh, this design, and we're going to talk about its advantages and disadvantages in a minute. So that's the moving coil. Another dynamic is, uh, oh, let's take a look at uh, this animation. I forgot about this. So um, you can see that we have uh, on the dynamic microphone the diaphragm there that's getting the sound, and then it radiate, it moves the voice coil. And then uh, that magnet there below um, is uh, what causes the electrons to move. So let's look at the, uh, the advantages of the moving coil versus the uh, ribbon and the condenser. It's the most rugged, so you'll find moving coils used a lot on uh, live sound, sound stage uh, applications where um, microphones can often uh, you know, get knocked over or, or, you know, get a fair amount of uh, abuse. Um, so they tend to be the most rugged. Um, ger uh, generally speaking, in most, most all cases, they need uh, no power to operate um, other than the acoustic energy just going into them. Um, generally, they're less expensive. Um, no, that's not always true. You can spend a lot on a dynamic mic, depending on which... Uh, kind you get, and and you can spend less on cheap condensers, but you know, pairing you know equal quality type situations, they they can be less expensive, and they're very difficult uh, difficult to overload or distort. You know, there's a point at which the sound pressure reaches a level too hot or too loud for the microphone to transduce anymore. In other words, it just can't. It moves to is uh, the extremes of where the diaphragm can move and the coil can move. And that's it. You know, it's not going to be able to produce any more output. At that point, the, the uh, microphone distorts the signal. So, but moving coils uh, can take a lot of SPL uh, levels, and uh, typically as high as 130, 140 decibels. So, let's look at some of the disadvantages. Um, so, the, my, the moving coil has these disadvantages. It has lower sensitivity than a condenser, which means that um, the signal to noise generally is going to be uh, not as good or lower. Um, the frequency and transient response is not as good. We talked about frequency response. Well, we say not as good, really. Or what I'm talking about there is really how flat it is, or how flat it can be, or or the range of frequencies uh, that it can actually respond to. So if you're using acoustic measurement, you would probably never use a moving coil because it's just not accurate enough or flat enough, um, which is what you'd want for that kind of situation. Um, so that's, you know, we talked about frequency. And with transient, what does that mean? Well, transient means uh, momentary. And, and so, um, you know, when we have signals uh, uh, that have very short durations, like pulse-like signals, uh, you know, that have quick... Um, amplitude changes, that's a transient. And these exist in musical signals. Uh, you know, when you when you play uh, percussive instruments, a lot of them have uh, transients, like I think of a triangle. Um, you know, even a snare drum has a quick transient. So, um, so basically it, what it means is the amplitude changes uh, from nothing to something really quickly. And uh, the moving coil can't move, because it has a lot of mass, it can't move very quick, quickly. So uh, that, this trans response is not very uh, accurate. Um, sometimes that's something we like the sound of, though. And we'll talk more about, you know, microphones, like I said, are not always chosen to represent the most accurate uh, representation of the sound, but one we like. And so they have a euphonic quality sometimes that uh, supersedes the accuracy. 
And so we'll talk about why maybe we use a moving coil over condenser on a snare drum, for instance. Um, and then most of them have patterns, uh, switch, uh, switchable uh, direct or, uh, directional patterns because um, they tend to be um, just mostly unidirectionals. Um, so you won't, in condenser microphones, you will find that they have this uh, capability sometimes, but not on uh, moving coils. And we'll talk more about directional patterns in a minute. So let's look at another type of uh, dynamic mic. This is a ribbon. So we're looking at the front of a ribbon. So that, that um, part in the middle there, uh, in the top middle, is the actual moving element. So in a ribbon microphone is very similar to uh, a moving coil in the fact that we have something that vibrates in, in, um, in, the, in the acoustic field uh, with the vibration of the air. Um, in this case, though, it's not a, um, a diaphragm connected to a coil, but a piece of corrugated um, aluminum uh, suspended in a magnetic field. So rather than having um, a diaphragm connected to a coil of wire, we just have this piece of aluminum that's corrugated, which means it has little you know, indentations in it. And um, that makes it a little stiffer. And, and, and when sound hits that, it moves and it creates a different uh, you know, and, and electron flow across the ribbon depending on which way it moves. Uh, just like the, the moving coil, but with a different element. So um, these are much more fragile and, um, and uh, but they have less, a lot lo um, lower mass and they're, so they're going to have better transient response than moving coils, which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's look at uh, another look view of this. So this is a little bit better picture. We can see the insulated ribbon uh, support there at the top and bottom and they're actually tensioned to a certain value so that um, they, they operate uh, with the flattest frequency response. Um, I've been told that there are plans out there you can build your own ribbons. It takes some know-how and a lot of patience I think to do that. <laughs> I would personally just buy mine. Um, but um, You can see there are other elements associated with it on the left. Those are little uh, schematic diagrams uh, sh um, showing the transformer um, that it matches what we call the impedance, which we'll talk about uh, later, um, of the microphone uh, element to the impedance of the microphone uh, preamplifier. And then there's a voice uh, filter there, which will, you know, um, will change the frequency response. Um, so looking at an actual uh, Royer uh, ribbon microphone, these are um, pretty high-tech uh, microphones. We have one of these in our recording studio. I think this is a 122, maybe it's a 123, can't tell. Uh, there's one that's um, just uh, dynamic and not powered, and they have a, a phantom-powered version, which is, you know, I think they were one of the first to have a, actually a powered uh, ribbon microphone. Generally, they were uh, ribbons were traditionally not powered but they uh, figured out that they could get a better um, higher quality signal uh, from the microphone if they put a little amplifier inside of it. So this microphone might be powered, I'm not sure. Um, so there are some phantom powered ribbons these days. You have to make sure though, you know that um, your ribbon is phantom powered before you send power, phantom power to it because uh, you could damage it, um, particularly if you plug it in while the phantom is uh, active. Which will, what is phantom? <laughs> we'll talk about what that is in a minute. But what that means is that we can actually power the microphone from the cable. All right, looking at this microphone, um, this is a 121. So it's the non-phantom powered. So let's take a look inside. We're going to take it apart. Um, and there's the ribbon moving with the sound pressure changes. And uh, this is a nice little 3D animation. And of course, there's a screen protecting the microphone on both sides so that you don't um, you know, have any um, particles hitting the, the ribbon directly. Um, the, the ribbon um, is very sensitive and can be damaged. So um, actually, let's take that back. I thought there was another part of the animation I just didn't see here. Pardon me here. Let's see if I can advance this. 
Oops, nope. <laughs> okay, it won't let me do what I want it to do here. Let's try that one more time. Sorry about that. All right, so we have to watch this uh, animation again. So ribbons are um, actually, you know, they, um, in the last 10 years, they've become very popular among a lot of studios because they have a really unique sound. And um, especially coupled with digital gear, they're kind of a nice um, compromise to how sterile sometimes or more harsh uh, digital can sound. And so, um, um, they're used often a lot in, in recording these days, record certain kinds of instruments. I like to use them um, on um, wind instruments, especially classical uh, recordings of wind instruments, flute, um, French horn, um, well, brass instruments too, French horn and clarinet. And um, I was hoping the other part of the animation would show up here in a minute. Um, French horn clarinet and uh, you know oboe those kind of instruments um, um, trumpet is really nice um, any, any uh, instrument where you kind of want to emphasize the mid-range frequencies well I guess that other part of the animation is not going to happen That's, there's a part where the ribbon explodes which I was hoping to show you hmm, that worked yesterday all right so what are the advantages they have a smooth sound quality that's really unique to them so Part of the reason we have different design types is because they have different characteristics and all microphones color the sound or distort the sound in some way. Um, and ribbons certainly do that. Um, but um, oftentimes that distortion can be a good match for a particular type of uh, instrument or sound that we're going for. Therefore, we'll choose a ribbon because of its characteristics. Uh, frequency response, for instance, and, um, and transient response. Which, by the way, the transit response is, is pretty darn good because we have a very small element. That piece of uh, corrugated aluminum moves pretty quickly and doesn't have much mass. Therefore, it can respond to quick sound pressure changes uh, pretty accurately. They have a good bi-directional response. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, bi-directional, bi means two. So they're, um, they're going to be sensitive in two directions, generally, uh, in front of the ribbon and behind the ribbon. And so there, it, there has to be a sound pressure difference between the front and the back of the ribbon for the ribbon to move. So any sound pressure uh, arriving at the side is going to have the same pressure on both uh, the front and back of the ribbon, and therefore the ribbon won't move. So it's not going to pick up sounds from the side. It's not going to be sensitive to sounds coming from the side of the ribbon, only into uh, sounds in the front and the back of the rib ribbon. So. Um, in instances where you need that kind of a response, which there are instances um, in terms of where you're setting up instruments and so on, that's a very, um, that can be very uh, helpful. Um, and then, of course, you know, when we think about old microphones, a lot of times we think about those big old RCA ribbons that we see in, uh, in people like Frank Sinatra and even Elvis using. Um, and uh, so they have a cool retro look to them. Um, the disadvantages are by far the most, they're the most fragile. They're so fragile that, um, as I was trying to show you earlier in that animation, it didn't work. Um, the dim, the, uh, the uh, ribbon can be damaged, um, just by sound pressure alone. So you wouldn't want to put, uh, especially an old ribbon inside a bass drum of a, of a drum set because almost assuredly, uh, the drummer would damage the, uh, the ribbon or you know, tear the ribbon even. Um, also, if you drop them, they're going to almost certainly get damaged. So they're very fragile. Um, they have the lowest output or sensitivity, therefore the highest noise, because if it has to use more gain in the microphone preamplifier, and as you do that, you get more noise. Uh, and then, as I said, um, loud sound pressure level, or SPL, can cause damage. Moving on to condensers. Um, so. What we're looking at here on the right is a uh, Neumann TLM-170 uh, condenser microphone. This is a large diaphragm, uh, a dual diaphragm condenser, which means that there actually has two different diaphragms, one in the front 
and one in the back of, and there's a fixed back plate between them. And we can actually get different uh, directional characteristics from this microphone with a switch. So we can make it unidirectional, omnidirectional, or bidirectional just by switching a switch. Once again, we're going to talk more about what the, those uh, terms mean in a minute. Um, so we have an animation on this one too. Uh, so there's the, the part that actually moves the diaphragm. And, it, and that's the front plate. And that's a gold sputtered uh, piece of uh, mylar usually. And uh, there's a fixed back plate uh, behind it that has uh, little holes in it that has certain acoustic properties. Anyway, when that moves uh, back and forth, it changes uh, value, electrical value called uh, capacitance of the microphone, which if that is, uh, a, well, first of all, the microphone capsule has to be what we call polarized, which means we put a battery, a type of DC power across um, the front and back plate so that there's a um, sort of electron buildup on one, uh, on the capsule. And as that moves, uh, the capsule moves back and forth, um, a certain voltage is, uh, is released or a current uh, or a cha uh, voltage change is, is, is arrived at when uh, the capsule is connected to another uh, electronic device or component called a resistor. And then after that, we have an amplifier. We'll talk about this in a second. So, um, so there's another type of uh, sort of subcategory of, of condensers we, we haven't talked about, which is the electric microphone. So as I was just saying, the, the, one of the needs of the condenser is to be polarized, which means uh, we have to connect a DC type uh, battery type supply across uh, the, the capsule for it to, uh, to operate. And uh, there are microphones called the Electret that have uh, what we call a pre-polarized diaphragm, which means it doesn't need that. It doesn't need that uh, 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 polarization voltage. But it still needs uh, power to power the electronics that are inside the microphone. So it's not that different than a condenser, really, um, in real terms. OK, so let's look at some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so the condenser uh, electric advantages, they tend to be very sensitive, the lowest noise type, um, because um, uh, they have uh, built-in amplifiers for one thing and um, and they can uh, the diaphragms can be made to be very sensitive especially the, uh, the smaller diaphragms or actually the larger diaphragms are more sensitive um, and then the f they also tend to have the widest frequency response um, there's some condensers that can have uh, frequency response way beyond human hearing I have a I have some um, uh, DPA Danish Pro Audio microphones that uh, go down to below uh, pick up frequencies as low as like three or four cycles, and as high as um, fifty thousand cycles. Um, obviously, uh, that's a little overkill, perhaps for um, recording audio. However, um, not really because um, even though we can't hear those frequencies, sometimes they have um, they have effects that. Um, that can be heard in, in other ways. Um, and some of them have switchable, switchable polar patterns. Polar meanings uh, basically directional. Polar is a really, um, when we're talking about polar, we're really referring to uh, the way um, sensitivity is sort of diagrammed using polar coordinates. Um, anyway, um, they're the most accurately, uh, they most accurately represent short duration transit uh, signals. And that's uh, really, I should say, only true when the diaphragm is relatively small. As you create a larger diaphragm, it's, you know, it does have um, more mass and, and, and the transit response suffers somewhat. So you're going to have the best transient response from condensers that have a, a very small uh, capsule or diaphragm because it can move more quickly. Um, the disadvantage is that they're fragile. They're sort of between um, ribbons and moving coils. Or, sh yeah, I should say they're, they're not as uh, fragile as ribbons, but more than moving coils. Um, they do require power because they, um, well, in the case of condenser, it requires a polarization voltage, but also it needs a power for the internal amplifier. 
So uh, from the capsule, it goes into an amplifier. And we can, uh, you can power those sometimes with batteries, but more often it um, uses phantom power. Phantom power means it's actually being powered through the same cable that's taking the signal from the microphone that we're going to amplify in the, in the preamp. Well, how do you do that? How do you feed signal both ways on the same cable? Well, we're the different types of signal. Uh, the type of signal we're feeding to the microphone is what we call a direct current signal. And um, the type of microphone uh, signal that's coming from the microphone is an alternating current or a changing current uh, direction, which is uh, uh, you know coming from the microphone. So um, the phantom power is simply being able to power the microphone microphone through the cable. So the microphone preamplifier um, feeds out a voltage, usually it's 48 volts DC, that goes to the microphone, powers the microphone, in the, in the case the condenser, um, polarizes the capsule, and then um, um, uh, the microphone, of course, is then able to transduce and, and feed an AC uh, signal across it, so the same wires. Um, they tend to be sensitive to humidity, um, so this can be a problem. And I had, you know, I used to record uh, some audio for the Arizona lottery commercials, and um, I had one or two instances where we were doing it during monsoon, and I had to put my um, condensers in my trunk in my car. It's a very humid day, and I brought it into an air-conditioned building, and I had some issues uh, for a while because of microphones. Um, um, got the moisture on the capsules because of the condensation of the uh, of the air uh, um, moisture on the capsules, uh, condensating uh, when it got into the cold air. So just like a glass will show you know water on the outside when when you have cold ice water in it, uh, same thing can happen to your capsules. And if that happens, it can short the capsule out, and it won't work until the capsule dries off. They also can be internally overloaded. They have an amplifier, um, and that amplifier can only take so much signal from the capsule. So that signal gets to be too great, uh, it uh, distorts. So even though the capsule might be able to produce more output, the um, internal amplifier can't accept anymore, and will get distortion. So we have ways to, to deal with that. We'll talk about in a minute uh, a thing called a microphone pad or attenuation switch can help with that. So let's look at directional patterns. Um, microphones could be sensitive uh, in one or more directions, or not. Um, so let's look at the different uh, definitions. Uni you know, the unidirectional is sensitive in one direction. So uni meaning one. Um, and then the type of polar pattern would be a cardioid pattern. Cardioid sort of uh, referring to a heart shape. So you can see on the far right there, we're looking at the polar responses uh, with that microphone, the Neumann we were talking about earlier, the TLM-170. And so what we're looking at there is a polar uh, graph. So if we're, you know, say the instrument that we want to record is at the zero um, degree mark. Uh, so we point it right at the instrument, and it would be most sensitive in that direction. And what the, um, the, the card shape shows us is that um, you know, as we, we go out from the center, uh, the sensitivity increases. So you can see as we move off to the left and the right, 45 and 315, that it doesn't go out to the same um, radius as it did at the, in, at the zero point. So it's getting a little less sensitive. Then at 270, it's quite a bit less sensitive uh, and 190, I mean at 92 and also. And then in the back at 180, it's very not uh, insensitive uh, to sounds coming from the rear. So uh, that makes it unidirectional, much more sensitive in the direction going towards zero than 180. Um, the next type of uh, response we want to look at is bidirectional, uh, two bi meaning two. So it uh, also has a pattern that we call a figure of eight because it looks like a figure of eight. And that's on the far left there at the bottom. And um, you can see it's sensitive on zero, um, but it's also equally sensitive at 180. So the front and the back are very sensitive, but at the sides, we have almost no sensitivity. So it rejects sound coming from the side of the microphone, 
um, but it picks up sound from the front and back. So that's the bidirectional response. But we can also make microphones equally sensitive in all directions, um, at least at some frequencies. And um, that pattern is called omni. Omni meaning all, so it's sensitive in all directions. So that's those are the basic um, directional pattern of our polar pattern types. So the polar pattern, when we talk about polar patterns, we're just referring to these charts that uh, measure sensitivity in space. Now, we're looking at two-dimensional representations here. Of course, we're dealing in a three-dimensional world. And so these are not really two-dimensional um, shapes. They're more three-dimensional. So they, they go, they come out of the page. And in the case of, let's say, the one in the center there, the, the uh, Omni, that's a sphere. It's not a, uh, not a circle. And the same is true of the heart uh, shaped in the bi cardioid in the uh, bidirectional. They come out and in, in, in into the page. All right, so looking at these again in a different form, um, we have um, sort of different variations of the cardioid. Uh, the cardioid can be made to be a tighter pattern, which means more directional in the, in the direction we're pointing the microphone. But it has a, an expense, which means we have this little um, kind of tumor-looking thing on the back of the, of the heart shape, which is a lobe. So it is actually going to make the back of the mic a little bit more sensitive, but it's going to make it uh, the microphone less sensitive to the sides. Uh, and then uh, going one step further, we have the hypercardioid. has even more of a lobe in the back, but once again, the, the side sensitivity is even less. So we can make, there's sort of different flavors of cardioid, if you will. We can make it a, um, a wide or fat cardioid or, or a tighter supercardioid or hypercardioid. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, how do we make microphones sensitive uh, in one direction? Well, one way, one way it's done is by using what we call ports on the side of microphones. Um, what these ports do, and you may have seen microphones that have a really long, uh, some of you have maybe used uh, uh, microphones that are, uh, that are shotgun microphones, we call them. Well, they'll have a, a bunch of ports along the side, and this is what's creating the, the, the uh, very uh, directional response, very uni uh, unidirectional re um, response. And so what happens is that these ports allow a certain amount of sound into the back side of the diaphragm. Now, if, it, if a completely equal amount of sound was let into the back side of the diaphragm, we'd have a bidirectional, right? Um, but what we're doing here is not allowing exactly the same amount in the, in the back of the microphone uh, diaphragm, but just a, uh, a small control amount. Therefore, we can make it uh, more directional, once again with the, with the um, caveat of having a little bit uh, less uh, rear rejection, but it makes it uh, less sensitive to the sides, and sometimes that's more important uh, when we want to have a certain amount of reach or have the microphone, let's say, out of the camera shot. If you, you know, uh, condense, I mean, uh, shotgun mics, uh, very hyper-directional mics, will be used in situations where we need to have the mic maybe out of the, away from the from the source, so that you don't see it, like in a movie or a, or a video um, situation, where you want to have the the microphone not visible uh, from the camera. One thing to to know is that you never want to cover the ports because. If you do that, the directional characteristics will be changed or lost. So if you put anything over those ports, you're, no, you're, you're disabling the directional characteristics of the microphone. And in some situations, if you're using it for sound reinforcement, you can actually get feedback. In fact, you know, you may have been to situations where people come up to a podium and they grab the microphone and it feeds back. Well, the reason that happens sometimes is because they're putting their, their hands over the port. And as they do that, then suddenly the microphone becomes more omnidirectional than unidirectional, and it picks up the loudspeakers that are amplifying their voice and causes a feedback loop. Um, so some side effects of directional microphones is that um, they can have different um, frequency response variations depending on um, the operation distance. What do I mean by operational distance? Well, I mean how close is the sound source to the microphone? So uh, what happens with uh, very directional mics 
is that we can have what's called proximity effect, which is an increase in bass, fre bass frequencies as we get closer to the microphone and a decrease uh, as we get further away from the microphone. So microphones that have unidirectional response actually have a working distance that is most flat, which means that the bass response is most flat. Uh, if you go closer than that, you're going to get a bass boost. If you get further away from, uh, than that, you're going to get a bass loss. So um, a lot of times people think of proximity effect only being the boost in bass, but really it's both. It's both a loss and a boost. Um, but um, it, a lot of times you experience it more as uh, something that happens as you get closer to the microphone. So you'll notice that if you use certain microphones, as you, you know, if you're doing a sound reinforcement thing and you put your voice, uh, your mouth really close to a microphone, you're, you'll hear your voice having more bass frequencies. And that's because of the proximity effect. Another uh, side effect is that we can have coloration of the frequency response. Basically, the frequency response can change depending on the angle that the sound uh, impinges on the microphone. So if, if the microphone is uh, pointed right at a source, it's going to sound generally the best. But if uh, the source is off to the side, not right at zero access point, um, the sound is going to change. The timbre of the sound is going to change, and the frequency response is going to change. And so um, that's what we call um, off-axis coloration. And um, there's a there's some um, um, diagrams that we can look at um, if you go to this uh, Neumann page here. And, you, know, you can they actually have shows you how the frequency response. Um, uh, changes or the directional pattern changes with frequency response. So it turns out that at uh, low frequencies, the cardioid is no longer is perfect of a heart shape, and and um, especially large diaphragm microphones, it actually becomes more uh, spherical, um, uh, more omnidirectional, and then high frequencies, it actually becomes uh, a narrower uh, looking uh, heart shape, in other words, more directional. Uh, and so the frequency response, or I should say that the polar response changes with frequency, uh, with, with the uh, angle of incidence and the frequency of uh, that's going into the microphone. So the, the polar response is going to change with frequency. So different frequencies, uh, the polar front re uh, response will be different. And so in class, I'm going to give you some better examples of this. So why do we have directional microphones? Well, to reduce leakage. Well, what is leakage? Leakage I mean, sounds like something that's you know uh, something that's spilling out of your or out of your microphone or into your microphone or something. Well, it is uh, things spilling into your microphones, unwanted sounds that are spilling into it. So you, oftentimes you'll be in a situation where you want to have microphones just pick up uh, a particular um, source and not other things in the same room that may be producing sound. So let's say you're miking um, a band uh, and you want to put a microphone in, in front of the guitar cabinet, but you don't want it to pick up the drums. Well, um, if you have a unidirectional mic, you can get uh, better uh, rejection of the drums than you could with an omnidirectional mic at the same working distance. So if you have it like if you need, you found the sound that you like is actually about a foot away from the cabinet, well, um, if you did the same, if you put the microphone with an uh, if you use an omni instead of a directional mic, um, uh, you would get a lot more drums uh, going into that mic than you would if you were using uh, a directional mic. So that's what leakage is: is unwanted sounds from other sources getting into the microphone. So having a directional microphone uh, helps with that. Also, you know, microphones are almost always used in rooms. And the room has an acoustic. And the acoustic, uh, sometimes we want to capture, and sometimes we don't want to, or minimize it, maybe. So if we use a um, directional mic, we can have the microphone a little bit further away from the, the instrument and, um, and reduce the amount of the the sound coming from the back or reflecting off the, uh, the surfaces of the room, uh, those those sounds going into the back and the side of the microphone will be reduced. 
if we're using an Omni, they won't be. So in some cases, we might want to use an Omni if we like the uh, acoustics of the room and, and uh, want to be the, have that be part of our, of our recording. In other instances, we may not want that. Um, also, we, they have greater reach. That just means they're, they're able to pick up sounds that are further away. So let's uh, look at the capsule once again. Uh, there's the actual microphone before we took off uh, the wind uh, screen in front of it. You can see the capsule kind of behind that black grid, uh, black mesh wire that protects the microphone and keeps uh, electromagnetic fields from impinging on it. Uh, so there's the internal capsule on the right. And um, let's look at uh, some other ribbon microphones uh, that you might find in the studio. We looked at the Royer. This is um, an AEA um, R84. We have a couple of these in our recording studio. These are really nice. They're re they have long ribbons in them. And um, they have a certain sound that's different than the Royer, for instance. Um, so you'll find that even though there are different design types, there'll be different uh, characteristics uh, of different manuers, manufacturers' designs. Of the, so in other words, you, you buy a Royer ribbon, it's going to sound different than an AEA ribbon. That's going to sound different than a cloud ribbon, etc. And the same is true as condensers. Um, so here's a, the shotgun microphone we we're, we were talking about earlier with all the ports along the side. We have, we have a long one and a little bit shorter one. So the longer one is a little more directional than the shorter one. Um, and oftentimes, if you're using these outside, you really have to use a lot of foam around, uh, especially the ports, so that you don't get the wind noise. Um, so they have these blimp-looking things that go over these microphones. Some are foam or some are actually like, uh, they look like a little animal fur around it. Um, those are to reduce the, the, the sound of the, the wind impinging on the ports. So this is a Neumann um, KMR81. Uh, um, we can also make a microphones that um, are meant to go against boundaries like floors or ceilings or tables or insides of the piano lid. So, um, so this is a boundary layer condenser microphone. It's a Neumann as well. It's a triangular shape. They're in that little black uh, part there. And I should say that little silver ring there is uh, where the element is. So typically you would place like this on a boundary. And um, we're going to talk about the advantage of this and I think our techniques lecture. But the point of it really is that um, to reduce uh, multipaths to the microphones. In other words, uh, typically you'll have a microphone that picks up the sound directly from a source, but also will pick up the reflections uh, of the room into the microphone. So you get the original source and then you'll get a delayed version of it. And uh, so when that happens, um, you can get um, anomalies in frequency response and basically certain frequencies canceling out and certain re frequencies reinforcing because of how the waves are adding together. And we'll talk more about that later. With the, with the boundary microphone, you don't get that because uh, you're right at the point where the reflection would happen. Um, so we, we can have microphones that have two capsules uh, in them, two diaphragms, and point those different directions if they're directional. Uh, this is a Neumann uh, um, USM69. We have a SM69 in our studio, an older version of this. Uh, and we can rotate the top uh, element there so that you can make it 90 degrees or other angles. And then you can change the polar patterns there uh, those with those switches. On our microphone, we have a box that's on the cable that does that. So uh, this is a certain kind of technique uh, called coincident, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Um, you can also put microphones in and, uh, what's called a dummy head. So to sort of uh, emulate, simulate what happens in our real hearing system, um, we could put microphones in a simulated ear and a head. And when this is done and you listen on headphones, you can get a very accurate uh, uh, sense of uh, being there. Uh, so 
binaural recordings are very powerful uh, in putting you in the in the sense of being at the at the location that it was recorded so they're very fun to listen to and we'll talk more about those in the next lecture uh, phantom power is something we talked about a little earlier um, let's go into the specifics um, so both the uh, condensers and electric microphones need power and they can be powered through uh, using a, what's called a balance uh, uh, XLR type um, microphone cable uh, XLR is the type of connector and there, it has three different um, conductors it has a shield uh, c uh, conductor and two signal carrying conductors um, which are uh, plus and minus um, polarity and so really what we have in the cable is um, a ground which is a shield and two signal carrying um, cables out of uh, polarity so there's a there's a uh, pin 2 and a pin 3 that this, the, they'll, they'll have the same signal but the signal will be out of polarity and the reason this is done we'll talk about a little bit later is, is uh, we can get rid of any kind of external <coughs> um, influences of other uh, magnetic and uh, electromagnetic uh, noise that might be trying to enter the cable or that does enter the cable and we don't want to uh, amplify at the preamplifier so we can cancel that out at the preamplifier. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, phantom power is a DC direct current uh, signal, like from a battery. So you know when your your car uses a battery, right? But uh, when you plug in something into the wall, that's AC. So if if you were able to, you some people have done this. So I don't recommend it. But you you know you can listen to the sound of <laughs> your signal coming out of your AC outlet. Uh, by hooking it to uh, a loudspeaker, it's probably going to blow up your loudspeaker real fast before anything happens. You probably would have to put some resistors and, and so on in between them. But uh, you would hear a 60 cycle tone because that's the frequency of our AC signal in our walls. Um, but um, so AC is an alternating current like what would come from a microphone. Um, you know, of course, in the case of a microphone, it'll vary as to what you know, acoustic signal we're bringing in that. Uh, um, signal now will be um, in electric form uh, <clears throat> coming out so the AC uh, frequency will vary with whatever frequency is going into the microphone unlike you know your power in your house will always be 60 cycles anyway phantom power is a DC signal and um, it's how the microphone gets powered internally and that's fed from the from the console or from the preamplifier to the microphone to power in, in the case of condenser uh, polarize the capsule. So looking at the back of uh, condenser microphones, we might have some switches. Um, in the TLM 170, we have, um, uh, you know, at the top there, you can see that round dial. That's the polar switch. Right now it's set to uh, omnidirectional, but we can switch it to, as you see, you can make, you go from omni to a more directional, uh, wide cardioid to a cardioid to a typer cardioid to a figure of eight just by turning that switch but um, we also have other switches uh, one that just uh, reduces frequencies below 100 cycles and that's a low frequency roll off so why would we want that well in some cases you're recording something um, like let's say a piccolo alongside a tuba in a studio well, piccolo does not go down to and have frequencies anywhere close to 100 cycles, where a tuba definitely does. So we don't want this microphone to pick up the tuba. We want it to pick up the piccolo. So if we can get actually better rejection by just switching on that low frequency roll-offs filter, and that's going to reduce the amount of uh, bleed or leakage of the tuba, as well as uh, it's going to um, make the microphone uh, have a a more dynamic capability. Um, also, the microphone pad is a way that we can deal with the fact that the microphone preamp can be distorted, or the microphone internal amplifier in the microphone can get distorted when loud signal levels uh, happen. So if we were using a condenser on a drum set, we'd probably almost certainly want to have that switch on so that we don't distort the internal amplifier. Or if we were in front of another loud sound source like a guitar amp, for instance, we probably would want to have it switched on.
recording a voice unless they're very loud uh, probably don't need it um, but that's the point of the switch you know you're going to only find these in condenser and electric microphones you won't find them on uh, moving coil rhythm um, so we have accessories uh, for microphones uh, windscreens pop filters so on the left we have a, a pop filter um, it differs from a windscreen in the sense that it, it goes between uh, usually a vocalist uh, and the microphone itself so uh, in this case we have a wire mesh type filter you can also use like nylon stocking type material uh, stretched over like a one of my interns made one using a embroidery hoop and uh, nylon stocking um, and you just place it between the, the, the singer and the microphone and when they say when the, the singer sings or says certain sounds like uh, that has like peas you can hear that popping right now because i don't have a pop filter on this microphone that sound of it kind of overloading at low frequencies is popping and that can be reduced greatly by using a pop filter between the microphone and the vocalist um, and you can do, get the same thing uh, same effect not as transparent in the high frequencies, however, by using a piece of foam over the microphone. In this case, it surrounds the microphone, so if the microphone has ports, it's going to it's going to go over the ports, and that's going to be very helpful if you're outside and there's wind. So uh, to have a windscreen, you really need to have something that surrounds the microphone, not just on one side. Um, so those are the two types that uh, we're looking at here. Um, you also can have microphones uh, pick up sound from the vibrations into the body of the microphone. Generally, microphones are designed so this is minimized. Uh, but um, if you have a microphone that's on a wooden stage, let's say with a drum set where the drummer could vibrate the stage quite a bit just by playing the drums, um, you might almost certainly want to have a way of isolating the microphone body from the stand which will be placed on the stage that's vibrating. So that's what a shock mount does. A shock mount just is like a shock absorber for your microphone. It simply just isolates the, uh, the microphone from vibration that could be uh, brought into the stand that holds the microphone. Um, so cables uh, that are used on professional microphones are, or as I said earlier, uh, a type that we call a low impedance balance design which means that um, impedance really refers to a, a, a property of electronic or electrical um, um, characteristics um, that refers to resistance. But impedance is more complex than just resistance because um, really it, it's about how it um, changes, the resistance changes with frequency and, and so on. So, um, the low impedance design, what you need to know here, the take home thing is that the low impedance allows you to have long microphone cables without loss. If you had a high impedance cables or a system designed to system, you would lose um, high frequencies just in the cable itself because the cable actually has properties called capacitance, inductance, and resistance that can create a what's called a low pass filter and reduce high frequencies. Uh, if you have long cables because the capacitance uh, of the cable will, and the resistance and the inductance will increase to the point where you start losing those frequencies. So by using low frequency or low impedance design we can have longer cables. So that's, if you understand it technically, just know that low, low impedance means that we can have long cables. Um, a balanced design, three wires, uh, means that we're going to have better uh, rejection of unwanted um, external noise. So as it turns out, microphone uh, or all any kind of wire can pick up signals other than what's meant to be sent across them. In other words, they can be like little antennae and pick up uh, radio uh, signals. They can pick up uh, signals from the um, AC, you know, uh, uh, power in the room, uh, especially if you have, um, let's say, lighting cables run next to your mic cables. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, electromagnetic signals and uh, and a property of a 
electromagnetic uh, signals is that they can induce them, their signals uh, without connection from one place to another. Whereas there's a magnetic field, just like you know the microphone uses that magnetic field change to create a signal. If we have a, a strong um, uh, magnetic field, that can actually uh, uh, induce a signal into a, a wire that's just near it. And so therefore, we can get a hum into our microphone uh, cable. If it were not balanced, we would probably be hearing a lot of hum from external uh, sources of, of power. So by using this balanced design, and, and remember what I said earlier, we have a three, three wires. And one wire is the ground, which is basically where the signal uh, you know, flows to. And um, the other two have the signal on it, but and they're exact. It's exactly the same signal. It's just that the polarity has been inverted. You remember what that means? That means it's uh, you know where the peak is. There's the dip. So if we add those signals together, in other words, if we on the um, microphone preamp side, uh, if we just put those uh, two wires together, they would totally cancel out the audio. We'd have nothing. Well, why would we want that? Well, here's the trick they're doing is that any signal that's going to get put into that cable is going to be uh, the same on both uh, of those wires. In other words, if we have an external signal going into the cable, it's going to have essentially the same phase or the same um, time relationship on both wires, which means that if we do uh, invert the polarity at the microphone preamplifier, uh, we can cancel it out, right? which we talked about in our first lecture, how we can cancel out uh, common um, s um, signals from left and right, for instance, of stereo. In this case, we have uh, pins two and three being our left or right, so to speak. Um, so, so if we cancel those signals out, then we get rid of the noise. But aren't we going to get rid of the audio? No, because we already thought ahead and made the audio out of polarity. So now, instead of canceling out, it's going to add together. So that's a little trick that we we use with balanced cables that we we feed out of polarity signals into the cable and then we invert the polarity of the of the of the, um, of the uh, microphone signal coming into the preamp at the preamp and that cancels out the noise and leaves the audio. So that's a neat little trick that they use to get better and quieter signals. So this is what it looks like inside a cable. Um, we have the ground, which is on pin one. And by the way, they're of course you know male and female uh, connectors. The the male is uh, what would go into, let's say, a microphone preamp input, and then the female part would be what plugs into the microphone. So in uh, so each one of those uh, pins or holes uh, has a cable connected to it, and if you look at that the bottom um, diagram there. One is the uh, ground. You see how the dash line comes out and goes around both of the cables. That means that's a shield. So there's actually a, a braided piece of metal that um, go, that uh, uh, stranded metal uh, braiding that goes around uh, the signal carrying wires of audio uh, plus and minus and three and two. Unfortunately, there isn't really a standardization now. So in some, some cases pin 2 will be plus, in some cases pin 3 will be plus, depending on what manufacturer makes uh, the gear. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. Some, some microphones have different polarities than others, and we can, you can have problems if you use those in close proximity, because uh, if you add those together in the mixing console, you can have cancellation. So we have to know, you know, you have to know your microphone's polarity. Uh, and you, there's simple tests to figure this out. Um, you, all you'd have to do is is hold your microphones together, um, you know, physically together, and speak into them, and, uh, and have them coming equally into your mixing console, and listening on headphones, perhaps. Uh, if uh, you're getting a good signal and it doesn't sound weird, it's, they're probably in polarity. But if it sounds real thin and like you're not getting any low frequencies, then they're out of polarity and you can test this by pushing your uh, little polarity invert switch on your mixer, which you hopefully would have one. Uh, and if it's, you know, in one case, you're going to find a lot more bass and, and natural sound. 
In the other case, you would find it sounding very thin because of the cancellation. So anyway, uh, so that's uh, what we have on pins 2 and 3 is the same audio signal out of polarity. And then up above that, you can see the actual connectors being removed and how the wires are soldered into the connector. So once again, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, this is how the noise is canceled out. The hot and cold wire carry the same audio signal, cold meaning plus and mi hot meaning plus, cold meaning minus, carry the same audio signal. Uh, just the cold one with the reverse polarity. And then at the input of the preamplifier, um, the polarity is, uh, is reversed. So that now it adds with the hot signal, which is, you know, allows us to get m a better, uh, uh, more signal uh, to noise. And also, it cancels the uh, any kind of common signal to both uh, hot and cold that might be induced uh, from magnetic uh, induction of power cables being next to the wire or other signals that we don't want. So that's how the signal's canceled out. So we're using that canceling principle to our advantage with balance systems. So here's some assignments for you to do, uh, and we're going to do some more fun stuff in class about you know how do you apply some of this stuff that we learned today. Make sure you bring your questions. Um, if you own some microphones, and most of us certainly own some microphones, we have a cell phone, we have a microphone. If we have a laptop, we have a microphone, generally. Um, those, um, I'd like you to try to identify what types those are and see if you've ever noticed the sonic differences of what different types of microphones sound like. And maybe you want to sort of articulate that in class for us. Um, so think about that. Um, and then locate, locate where these microphones are in, in your life and which ones you have and what types of microphones you typically use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, see if you can produce the proximity effect. And if you can't, why? Um, and also, if you're really technically inclined, see if you can measure the frequency response of a mic. Uh, that's not going to be easy for some people to do, but um, some of you engineers out there might think of a methodology that would allow you to do that. So I'd like to hear that. So um, some good uh, videos and things to, to get externally are, um, here's a video on how uh, Neumann microphones uh, are made. Uh, and I should include these links. Let's see. I don't think I can. Yeah, I'll include these links in, in class. I'm sorry. I, I, in fact, I think um, I'll try to include these in the PDF version of the uh, of the presentation. Sorry about that. But this is a video on uh, how microphones are made. I think it's YouTube. Uh, video on design types, microphone buying guide, uh, and understanding microphone specifications videos. So I just changed the format of this. So I, that's... Um, why it's uh, not uh, the way I should have it here. So uh, this is the first time I've done the uh, audio voiceover, so I apologize. Anyway, I hope uh, this has been informative, and please bring in your questions. And in class, I hope to go into more depth um, with you on how we can apply some of the things that we've learned. All right, I look forward to seeing you in the next class. Take care. <laughs>